Good morning, everyone. It's great to see everybody today. What a treat, Pastor Vanderweide, Mrs. Vanderweide. Great to see you. Yay. Um, welcome, all of you. What a beautiful day to be here to worship in the house of our Lord, to worship our Lord. And we have people from Tennessee over here. It's a long drive just to attend church. <laughs> You flew. Well, okay, then it's not quite so bad. Did the helicopter land right over here at the school? Beautiful. It's great to see you. Marilyn is going to be giving us some special music today. Thank you for being willing to. Um, of course, Brenda, thank you for all the music you provide for us today, too. Not Susan, Brenda. Um, any announcements, prayer requests, praises people would like to share? Linda. Uh, first, uh, pray for mom. She's her vertigo's back this morning, so it's, that's yeah, really hard on her. Um, second, uh, there's uh, Emily, uh, my daughter Emily, my oldest, um, is part of the last graduating cast class of Casanova College, graduating next weekend. Um, last weekend, we were able to go to her. She's a uh, again, has her will have her uh, bachelor's of fine arts in uh, fashion design, and she just had her fashion show last weekend. Um, it, it was awesome. Her theme was the historic carousel, and every, all the elements of the costumes were, you know, reflected the elements. It, it was just incredibly beautiful. Um, God has really given her a talent. Um, the prayer for her is that she has applied for a fellowship. And because um, what she's really interested in is actually the preservation, the curation of historic costume. And so um, there's a fellowship opportunity that could get her into some museum studies, you know, uh, so that, so just pray if that's, you know, the way the Lord wants her to go, that that will open up because it's going to be pretty competitive, I would imagine. Um, and then third, uh, I, don't know if anybody realizes because I don't know how many people I've talked to but my youngest Julia who got uh, last year got her uh, uh, associates in theater um, she will be uh, attending Potsdam to continue school in the fall um, to get her, you know finish get a bachelor's uh, in um, uh, uh, arts administration is what she's looking at so you know I just would like prayer for my girls that their paths would be set straight before them, um, you know? So thank you very much. Thank you, Linda. Others, do want to keep Rick Darling in our prayers. He's not well, and we need to keep thinking about him and Inez. Also, Mark Beardsley, we're not really sure where Mark is right now. We, uh, we tried to call him this morning, went to voicemail. I did text him, but got no response. So maybe he's sleeping in. Hard to say, but let's keep Mark Beardsley in our prayers also. Ruth Ann? I just wanted to say what a wonderful time we had yesterday, and thank you for everyone who attended. It was just, Sherry Ann is a special, special woman. So just to remind you, we have another dinner today right after church. We're having haystacks. <laughs> It's going to be a, a wonderful meal, so hopefully you can all stay and enjoy. Um, we left everything set up from the ladies' luncheon, so there's lots of lots of seating out there, and we'll be using the children and worship room for the food. And oh, and I don't want to forget, next Saturday is Pat Moore's 90th birthday party here in the afternoon, from two to four. So. You know, dear sweet Pat, she wasn't able to make it today. She's very tired right now, but she, I told her she's got to rest up for her big birthday party next week. So that's from 2 to 4, just an open house reception here in the Fellowship Hall. Thank you. Thank you, Ruthann. Anybody else? I think Pastor Dave has some stuff for us. Pastor? You did a pretty good job covering all the bases there, so thanks so much. Uh, the only thing I would mention, uh, uh, that uh, Alina is home and now able to care for herself, so we're thankful for that answer to prayer. And we're thankful for uh, John and, and Del and John's progress, a, a real answer to prayer in his case. And we're also continuing to pray for Carol, who has gone to Houston and is... Uh, 
you know, visiting the doctor and making some decisions there. So keep praying for her as well. And if you don't know what a haystack is, then stick around and find out. Uh, <laughs> that's all I can say. I'm not going to explain it to you. Hang around, make your own haystack, and eat it. And it's mostly all healthy food from what I understand. This isn't like a banana split or something. This is a haystack, right? Yeah. <laughs> oh, well. Uh, it's so good to see all of you this morning. Thank you for coming to join with us this morning and to add your voices to our voices and your worship to our worship as we're here to worship our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. May his kingdom come. May his will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. And Brenda, you can get us all started. Thanks so much. I stand in awe of you. We're here today to worship uh, 
God the Father, God the Father Almighty, and Jesus Christ, his only Son, who has risen from the dead. He's alive, and he lives forevermore, and he sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I have a uh, call to worship for you this morning, which is from the Sermon on the Mount, which is one of Jesus' first sermons and most famous and popular sermons. Uh, This first part we know is the Beatitudes, uh, and I like to call it uh, rules for the kingdom of heaven. Uh, the, the, The kingdom of heaven is a little different than the kingdom here on earth, and And things are done differently in God's kingdom. So uh, listen to these words of Jesus this morning as we begin our worship. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the children of God. And blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are you, When people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me, rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. God's kingdom. God's kingdom is coming. God's kingdom is emerging. As Jesus often said, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's near. It's within you. It's among you. And so today, as we consider Jesus, our glorious King, and his wonderful kingdom, let's begin our service this morning with prayer. Father, we're so grateful for all of your goodness and grace to us, so grateful for the life that you've given us, We're so grateful that we can take a pause from our busy lives and come into this sanctuary and worship you. And so, Father, I would ask you that as we have not only put our bodies into this building, we ask that you place our hearts and our minds to seek after you to worship you, to pause and listen to you. Lord, free our minds from the distractions, the worries and cares of this life that keep us from experiencing all that you have for us. We come here this morning hoping to experience your presence, to receive your forgiveness, mercy, and grace. And I ask that you'd help prepare us to come to your table remembering what Christ has done for us. Father, we come humbly this morning, knowing that we have sinned, that we have fallen, that we have failed, that many times we don't live up to uh, the standards that we would like to and that you would like us to. We humbly ask your forgiveness, knowing that you're faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Won't you do that this morning? Make us whole and make us holy as only you can do. We put our lives in your hands. We take a moment and lift up those who we mentioned uh, in prayer this morning. There's people in our, our church family that are hurting, that need your touch, that are lonely, that that may be sick and need to be healed, that have big decisions before them and need your wisdom. And some are just weak and they need your strength. Well, Lord, we all have family members who 
are far away from you, and Lord, we ask that they may be brought near by the blood of Christ and by the, the pursuit of the Holy Spirit in their lives. But we're so grateful that John is home and that John and Del are, are, are doing life together again and, and uh, that he's healing and getting stronger and better every day. Thank you so much for that. Continue that process of health and healing in his life. And be with Rick Darling and with Inez as uh, they try to figure out what exactly is going on with him. We lift him into your hands and care. And be with our, our dear friend Mark, who had surgery and is now um, in rehab, and we think he's at Beech Tree. But one thing we know for sure, you know where he is. And you're present with him. And you're the one who gives him strength. And you're the one who brings about healing and health in his life. And we ask, won't you do that for him today? Be present with him. Be with our dear friend Pat and uh, strengthen her and enable her to enjoy her 90th birthday with her family and friends. Be with Gary's friend Amaretta, who's uh, getting close to going into hospice. Lord, we pray for her uh, and we place her in your hands and in your care. It's a hard time of life that she's going through. I pray that she won't go through that alone, but that you will be with her. And Lord, we pray for our friend Beverly uh, and the vertigo and the different things that she faces, the different challenges she faces every day. We ask for your health and healing in her life and be with her granddaughters as they make decisions then and uh, pray that you'll open doors for them. And Lord, I pray that somewhere in the back of their minds, your presence, your goodness and grace would spring forth. Thank you for Alina that she's home and we ask for uh, continued health and healing for her as well. And be with Carol and with Bob as they travel and as uh, Carol gets diagnoses and, and plans for treatment. Uh, give them wisdom. And uh, we pray for the best of possible outcomes for Carol. And Lord, there's so many people uh, here in the sanctuary and who are joining us online and, and all of us have someone that we're praying for, someone that we're lifting up to you, someone whose names we mentioned before your throne. And so we just take a moment now to silently whisper those prayers and lift up those friends to you. Father, I know that you hear all prayers spoken and unspoken that nothing, that no one escapes your watchful eye and your care. You care for the birds of the field, uh, the birds of the air and the flowers of the field, and so you care for your children as well. And won't you extend your care, not only to this church family here this morning, but to those who are joining us by way of the internet. May your blessing, may your goodness and grace flow to each one of them as well. We take also a moment this morning to pray as Jesus himself taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you for adding your prayers to my prayers this morning. This time I'd like to invite the children to go to children and worship and, and don't be getting into those haystacks yet. Right? Whatever they're doing out there. And the rest of us, let's uh, sing a, stand up and sing a couple songs about 
our Lord and our King Jesus. Um, we'll start with Our God Reigns.
Father, thank you for all of your goodness and grace to us, the gift of your Son, the gift of life, the gift of this beautiful world to live in. You provided for our every need and watch over us daily. And we're so grateful. So we just want to pause a moment this morning to express our gratitude to you and to offer you a portion of our substance to be used for your glory. To help us lift up the name of Jesus in this place and around the world. I pray that you multiply these gifts and use them to help us shine his light and share his love. Also, we offer you our voices. Use our voices to glorify you. We offer you our hands to serve you. We offer you our hearts, our hearts for your home. Now be with us the rest of the service and as we leave this place today. In Jesus' name, amen. I have to give you a very high grade on the singing today. You did a great job singing, and you can take two or three minutes now to visit with one another. And, and, uh, and, but, but just remember, that doesn't make the message any, any shorter. Well, it was almost like a switch was turned on. It was, one minute was really loud, and then the next minute, we're all waiting on you. I'd like to invite you to uh, help me read my text this morning. It's from Luke chapter 22, and I believe I'm beginning in verse 7 here. So I'll start out, and you can keep up with me. Then came the day of unleavened bread on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. Jesus sent Peter and John saying, go and make preparations for us to eat the Passover. Where do you want us to prepare, to prepare the Passover for it, they asked. And they left and found things just as Jesus had told them. So they prepared the Passover. And after taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among you, for I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And, 
In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. But the hand of him who's going to betray me is with mine on the table. A dispute also arose among them as to which of them was considered to be the greatest. For who is greater, the one who is at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one who is at the table? But I am among you as one who serves. Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift all of you as wheat, but I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail, and when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. I tell you, Peter, before the rooster crows today, you will deny three times that you know me. Thank you for reading God's word with me this morning. As always, it's a pleasure and honor and a privilege to be able to share God's precious and powerful word with you. For these past few weeks, I've been stuck on Easter. I've been stuck on those events that happened on Easter day um, when the stone was rolled away, when the tomb was empty. For Jesus Christ had risen as he said, and then after that he appeared to his disciples. He began to speak to them, he showed them his hands and his side, and he began to speak to them and teach them and and remind them of those things that were important. Kind of let them know what the plan would be going forward and what their jobs would be and what their mission would be and what their responsibility would be. I've been looking at the ideas, what happened to these disciples who had, well, betrayed him, denied him, and scattered, and then were hiding in a room locked, with the doors locked for fear of the Jews, thinking they might be next. What happened to them that changed them from cowards to men who would turn the world upside down? So we've been talking about that. Well, Jesus appeared to them. Jesus began to teach them. And we know that later on, the power of the Holy Spirit came into their lives. But we're going to step back a little bit from that today as we're coming to the Lord's table. So we're going to go back uh, before the resurrection, before the crucifixion, before his arrest, as they were sitting at the table and this passage which we read sets the stage for coming to the Lord's table. This is when he instituted this new covenant with, with them and with us. And it seems to me as I read Luke 22, and of course if you ever read the book of Matthew, you would see there's a lot of things about the king and about the kingdom of God. I think you can easily recall, as I do while preparing this message, that Jesus was always saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The kingdom of heaven is near. The kingdom of God is close. And so, that brings me to my thought for today. Jesus is the king in the kingdom of God. You really can't have a kingdom without a king. 
and Jesus as the crucified, risen Lord. As without a doubt, the king in the new kingdom. Now, before we get going on this, and I begin to pull out some of these statements that he made about the kingdom of God here in Luke 22, let's pray. Father, we're just so grateful uh, for your word, for giving us your word to uh, tell us the story of your great love for us, of the gift of your son, of the price that he was willing to pay for us, of his death on the cross, how he poured out his life blood for us, and then how he rose from the dead. But today we're looking at the story of how he prepared this table for us so that we might remember forever what he has done for us, purchasing our pardon, forgiving our sins, ministering grace and mercy to us, and today, won't you prepare our hearts to come to the table and receive the forgiveness, mercy, and grace that he has provided for us when he went to Calvary's cross. Father, won't you send your Holy Spirit to open our ears to hear and open our eyes that we might see and touch our hearts to believe and receive all that Christ paid for on the cross and all that you have for us today. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Jesus is the king in the kingdom of God. The way this discussion starts out, they have prepared the uh, Passover meal. They're gathered together, they're seated. If you have read John, you know that Jesus washed their feet. And I mean, they're but they're all together. And then he starts out this, this discussion. He says, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. I can't help but think, what a strange thing to say. Because, I mean, Jesus knows what's going to happen next. He knows that soon he's going to be, well, betrayed, denied, arrested, tried, convicted, and crucified. Not something that he could be looking forward to, except for this is why he came. But there's a humanness in Jesus and a humanness in all of us that we don't necessarily like pain and suffering. For instance, I had a dentist appointment this week. And they've been working on this root canal on one of these teeth of mine. And, and uh, I mean, the process is somewhat unpleasant. They drill down in. First, they give you this nasty shot, and then they drill down in there and, then, and get the root out, and then they put a temporary cap on there, and then in a few weeks, you get a permanent crown, and uh, it's just the whole process. And I guess I was a little on edge because as we're driving down there, Ruth Ann says to me, what's wrong with you today? <laughs> It just was a little edgy because I knew what was going to be happening over the next couple hours, and that's just a root canal. Jesus is going to be crucified for the sins of the world, but he eagerly awaited this Passover meal with them before he suffered. There was something special about this, this night uh, that he wanted them to remember, and there were truths and ideas that he wanted to convey to them that were important to him and that he knew would be important to them. And he says, for I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. Most of us spend most of our time thinking about our next meal or what we're going to eat next or what we're going to do next. But he's thinking about the kingdom of God. And as he's raising this cup, he, he says, we're not going to do this again until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And, and he even says, take this and divide it among you. I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. He's thinking about the kingdom of God. 
because that's what's next. He's, he's, he's thinking about what's next and, 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 and not just this temporary moment. And yet he's preparing this table for them so that they will remember this night and remember what he's done for them forever. I used to think, I used to think, if I can just find that verse in here where it says he took the bread and drank the cup with them after his resurrection, that would prove that the kingdom of God has come. Because he said, I won't do this again until the kingdom of God comes and if I could find that verse, and I can't find that verse. I see one time he broke bread with them, and then he disappeared. I see another time he ate a piece of broiled fish with them, but it's not recorded where he actually took the cup and took the bread and celebrated communion with them after his resurrection. So he's speaking of a later time at the consummation, at the marriage feast of the Lamb. He's going to raise the cup, and we're going to all come to the table together and celebrate what he has done for us. And yet it's so puzzling to me and confusing to me and evidently confusing to all the commentators too because nobody seems to be in agreement exactly when the kingdom of God comes. Jesus is running around everywhere saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And I just can't believe, well, it's still not here yet. So if I talk to my friends, the Jehovah's Witnesses, well, it came in, in uh, 1917 and 1925. and 19, I mean, they've got a, a, a number of dates when the kingdom was supposed to come. And, and, uh, and I don't know what their latest date is. But I think some of the most reliable commentators say uh, that the kingdom of God is not just about real estate. It's about the rule and reign of God. And we pray it every week. Your will be done. Your kingdom come, your will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. And so somehow the kingdom of God is more like a little seed that is planted and is growing and is growing and is flourishing and is emerging as time goes on. You know, whenever anyone is born again, we've been born once in the flesh. You're born again in the spirit. When you're born again, you're born again into the new kingdom. You're now a child of the king in the kingdom of God. And when people obey the rules of the kingdom, like I said, when you, when you live by those uh, beatitudes and you choose to follow the rules of the kingdom of God, then the kingdom of God grows and the kingdom of God is established in your life and in the lives of those around you when you become the servant of all instead of the Lord of all, you're going to become great in the kingdom. The other thing that he says here that's very interesting, he says, this cup is the new covenant in my blood that is poured out for you. He says it's a new covenant. Well, why do we need a new covenant? What's wrong with the old covenant? Well, what's wrong with the old covenant is nobody could keep it. Nobody could achieve it. Nobody could be righteous enough to uh, receive the benefit of the old covenant. We could not keep the law. But when Jesus went to Calvary's cross and as he died, he says these words, it is finished. His mission was completed. He paid the price and penalty for sin and he fulfilled the law of the old covenant. Something that we couldn't do, and yet he could do it, fully paying the price for us. And so now the old covenant is fulfilled and he established a new covenant, the new covenant for the new 
kingdom that he set up for us. Now, it's true we haven't got to that point yet where the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdom of our God and of his Christ. Someday that will happen. Someday it will be completely consummated and we'll sit there with Christ and all the redeemed at the banquet table and Christ will raise the cup and these words will be fulfilled. But until then, God's kingdom is still emerging. See, we've got the rules of the kingdom. We've got the king of the kingdom. We've got the new covenant of the kingdom. We're born again into the kingdom. God's kingdom is emerging right in our very midst. Think of how uh, he answered this question of the Pharisees in Luke 17. Once it says on being asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, Jesus replied, the kingdom of God is not something that can be observed. Nor will people say, here it is, or there it is, because the kingdom of God is in your midst. The kingdom of God is among you. The kingdom of God is within you. The kingdom of God is not something that you see and say, it's right here. The kingdom of God is established as the people of God. Pray for the kingdom of God, for your will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. And then they live their lives in such a way that God's will and purposes and plans come to pass in their lives and in the lives of others. The di difficult part is this. We still have the kingdom of this world, the kingdoms and culture of this world, and yet we have the kingdom of God emerging, and most Christians feel like they got one foot in the kingdom of God and one foot in the kingdom of the world. And so there's this paradox, there's this tension, there's this pulling, because while there are certain things about this world and this culture we might like and don't want to let go of, and yet there's something even better, even more wonderful about the kingdom of God. And we'll only be whole and fully satisfied and complete when both feet are firmly planted in God's kingdom. And when that day finally comes, when they do say, the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. Here's a thought. Because parts of the kingdom of this world remain, some of us find it difficult to see the love and goodness of God. I'm not necessarily some of us in this church. Some who are living in the world have a hard time seeing the kingdom of God, have a hard time seeing the love of Christ, have a hard time seeing his goodness, his grace, his miracles. People who are living in the kingdom see the hand of God in their lives every day. We see answered prayer. We see God working and moving. We hear and witness the prompting of his Holy Spirit. But people in the world, they don't see any of this. And when we look at this world, we see, we see death, we see brokenness, we see devastation and destruction. We see that the kingdoms of men often bring hardship and pain. But when we look at Jesus and his kingdom, we look at the price that he paid, the love that he gave, the kingdom that he promised, the table he prepared, the forgiveness that he purchased, then we truly can see the love of Christ. Jesus had this last supper with his disciples with a cup and with the bread and with the new covenant. And then what did he say? Do this. Do this in remembrance of me. And I often like to say, what is it that Jesus wants us 
to remember? Well, the first thing he wants us to remember, I believe, is the seriousness of our sin. You see, if our sin wasn't really serious, Christ wouldn't have to die at all, would he? If there was any other way to forgive us, wouldn't he have chosen that way? If there was some way that we could earn forgiveness or deserve forgiveness or purchase forgiveness, wouldn't God have done that instead? But our sin was so serious that God, who can do anything he wants, could not say, that's all right, I forgive you. No, our sin was so serious, it required Christ to come and live a holy, godly life and then lay down that life on the cross. The second thing he wants us to remember is the price that he paid. Yes, grace and forgiveness and mercy is free for us. But it's not cheap because Christ paid a horrible price on the cross to purchase our pardon. The pain that he experienced, the suffering that he went through, shedding his very life's blood, uh, blood poured out for us. We remember the seriousness of our sin and the price that he paid. And the third thing I believe he wants us to remember is it wasn't duty, it wasn't compulsion. There was only one thing. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross for the love of you. It was his great love that compelled him to go to the cross and lay down his life for you and for me and all who are willing to believe and receive his forgiveness, mercy, and grace. It's available to all who believe. He says, to as many as received him, to them he gave the power, the right, the privilege, the opportunity to become children of God, even to those who believe on his name. And so as we prepare to come to the table this morning, remember, he did it for you. The king, the king of the new kingdom, laid down his life for you and for me. Father, we're so grateful. Grateful for God's goodness and grace. Grateful for all that you've done for us. Grateful for the gift of your son who was willing to pay that ultimate price, that ultimate sacrifice to purchase our pardon that we might become children of God, that we might be sons and daughters in your kingdom, that our lives, that our hearts and lives might be changed forever because of the work done on Calvary's cross. So help us today to remember and ask forgiveness for our sins. To consider the price that he paid. And to thank you for your great love for us. That Jesus in that garden said, not my will, but your will be done. Thank you for Jesus and all that he did for us. Yes. And it's in his precious name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> Our friend Marilyn is going to sing for us a song that uh, she wrote as we consider coming to the table of Christ. Thank you, Marilyn. The title is, Will You Look and See His Love? Will you look and see his love as he hung upon that cross he paid the ultimate sacrifice to save the souls of all our lives Father forgive Now we know what the Bible shows. We have a 
choice to where we go. This perfect child became a perfect man to show us how to live as our Heavenly Father planned. But many neighbors Fail to really see Called crucify him While filled with unbelief Father forgive them He cried For they know not what they're doing but now we know what the Bible shows. We have a choice to where we go. Can you express your gratitude to thank him for all that he went through? accept the many gifts he gives will you look and see his love will you look and see his love Thank you so much, Marilyn. Marilyn came up to me last week and she said, I wrote a song that would go perfect with your message today. I said, well, I think it'll go perfect with next week. <laughs> next week's message too, so thank you for sharing that. The other words that came to my mind uh, today as I was mulling things over was these words from the song of Michael Card, and I'll just share the title with you right now, Love Crucified Arose. Is there any better way to put it? Love Crucified Arose. That's what he did for us. Won't you join me, uh, with me in praying a prayer of confession before we come to the Lord's table this morning? Have mercy upon us, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercies, Blot out our transgressions. Wash us thoroughly from our iniquity and cleanse us from our sin. For we know our transgressions and our sin is ever before us. Create in us a clean heart, O God, and put a new and right spirit within us. Cast us not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from us. Restore to us the joy of your salvation and uphold us with a willing spirit through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. As we come to the Lord's table this morning, I want you to know that we serve an open communion in this church, which simply means you don't need to be a member of this church to come to the Lord's table and receive his forgiveness, mercy, and grace. But you do need to trust fully in Christ as your only hope for salvation and forgiveness. You need to be a member of the church at large, of the body of Christ, and you need to have invited Christ into your heart, asked him to forgive your sins, and come today and receive mercy and grace. Allow the Lord to minister grace to you through his table this morning. Would you join with me in the communion prayer? The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Lift the Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Holy and right it is, and our joyful duty 
to give thanks to you at all times and in all places, O Lord, our Creator, almighty and everlasting God. You created heaven with all its host and earth with all its plenty. You've given us life and being and preserve us by your providence. But you've shown us the fullness of your love in sending into the world your Son, Jesus Christ, the eternal word made flesh for us and for our salvation. For the precious gift of this mighty Savior who has reconciled us to you, we praise and bless you, O God. And with your whole church on earth and with all the company of heaven, we worship and adore your glorious name. Holy, 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 God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Most righteous God, we remember in this supper the perfect sacrifice offered once on the cross by our Lord Jesus Christ for the sin of the whole world. And in the joy of his resurrection and in expectation of his coming again, we offer ourselves to you as holy and living sacrifices. Together we proclaim the ministry, mystery of the faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. So send your Holy Spirit upon us, we pray that the bread which we break and the cup which we bless may be to us the communion of the body and blood of Christ. Grant that being joined together with him, we may attain to the unity of the faith and grow up in all things into Christ our Lord. For as this grain has been gathered from many fields into one loaf, and these grapes from many hills into one cup, grant, O Lord, that your whole church may soon be gathered from the ends of the earth into your kingdom. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. The Lord Jesus, on the same night that he was betrayed, took bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us pray. Father, we're so grateful for the gift of your son and that he was willing to pay the price for our sin, our sin which is so serious, our sin which we could not pay for ourselves, this debt that we owed that we could not pay, that he was willing to pay for us. His body was broken that we might be made whole the pain that he experienced, the suffering he endured, he did it for a reason. It was his great love for us. And so we are grateful that his body was broken for us. This piece of bread is not his body, but it symbolizes what Christ did for us when his body hung on that cross. So we thank you 
We thank you, Father. We thank you, Jesus, for the price you paid for each one of us. May it be real to us today. May we receive the benefit of your suffering this day. In Jesus' name, amen. The bread in which we break is the communion of the body of Christ. Do this in remembrance of him. After they had supped, he took the cup. He said, this cup, this cup is the New Testament, the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let us pray. Oh, crimson is the flow that washes white as snow. Lord, we're so thankful. So thankful that Jesus was willing to go all the way. Pay the ultimate price for our sin. And this cup, which is not the blood of Jesus, but represents, symbolizes his blood which was shed for us. We try to be good. We try to do the best we can, and yet we always fall short. We always fail. None of us can be perfect, and your word says there is none righteous, no, not one. All our righteousness, even our best efforts, are as filthy rags. But the righteous Christ laid down his life for us, taking our place, paying the price and penalty for our sin. He died so that we can live. He left the glories of heaven and went to hell so that we can go to heaven. He experienced separation from you. Well, the sin of the world was upon him. He experienced being without your presence, that we might come into your presence. Not that we deserve it, not that we have earned it, not that we can purchase it or even afford it. He paid a price that only he could pay so that we might live. And we're forever grateful for his blood, which was shed for us to wash away and cleanse every sin and stain and every guilty conscience. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for sending Jesus. And thank you, Jesus, for paying the ultimate price for us. In Jesus' name, we pray. The cup which we bless is the communion of the blood of Christ. There's so many songs we could sing at this time, but I've chosen to sing When I Survey the Wondrous Cross, considering what he has done for us.
Thank you, Lord, for what you did for us. Now may the love of the Father, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the presence and power of his Holy Spirit be with you today. Amen.